go to any, especially primarily white institutions, you look on the halls of, of individuals who were there before, especially as presidents, and, and especially in, in administrative capacities, overwhelmingly white and overwhelmingly male. Right? So these are all examples in which white supremacy operates in our society. It's one of the things that, I, with that when I teach um, human diversity and oppression to my graduate class, I, I always kind of essentially compare white supremacy as just the air we breathe. It's just so part of our everyday consciousness that unless someone were to actually specify certain ways in which white supremacy operates, we, we tend to think of it as, oh, that's just how life is, or that's just how education is, right? Or that is how um, the, the music industry is, right? But we see oftentimes uh, influences where white values, beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors are elevated against those of, for individuals who are non-white. Okay, so this is what I mentioned before in terms of Collins. <laughs> and um, she, came, she actually uh, focused on what are the typical media tropes in which black women uh, pretty much exemplify. We saw Hattie McDaniel um, in the 40s, actually was actually one of the first examples of the mammy character that we see, right? So the, the mammy character is typically there to her whole purpose in life is to serve her white household, to care for the children of the white household, to put the interest of the white household before not only her own interest, but oftentimes over the interest of her own children, of her own family. Um, the matriarch is essentially the strong uh, black woman <coughs> character, right? She, she's essentially emotionless, right? There, there's nothing she cannot do. Um, a lot of the research shows that even though on the surface this might appear to be a very complimentary narrative of black women, it also is, is the cause of a lot of their depression and untreated depression, high levels of anxiety, right? Because if you believe that you, you should be strong in our context, not show emotions, carry the burdens of not only your own personal burdens but those of your family as well, it can be a very, very mentally exhausting an actually mentally toxic environment uh, context for black women. The welfare mother is third. Her typical purpose <coughs> in life is to just breathe, have children, right? Uh, you listen to uh, a lot of the uh, political rhetoric only to collect a government check to get rich. Uh, this is one of the things I always challenge my undergraduate students on. No one gets wealthy from welfare. They just don't. I mean, that people might need to believe that and hold on to that belief for dear life, but no one becomes wealthy from welfare. Uh, the lady is essentially, is someone that's essentially educated, right? Um, she is in many ways like Olivia Pope, right? So she's, she's educated. Some and so she's very goal-driven. Some and so that she's able to uh, open her own uh, consulting firm. Then we have the Jezebel, who essentially is only interested in um, uh, exploiting her sexuality, right? So it's all about presenting her body in a very sexual way so that men will be attracted to her body. Then we have the diva. This is actually someone that um, looks down on others. She also, her whole purpose in life is to elevate her social standing as well. Um, the gold digger is oftentimes is interested in elevating her social sta uh, sta standing, but according to Collins, it kind of differs a little bit in the sense that the diva is more educated than, for example, the gold digger. And then the freak is essentially someone that, well, unlike the Jezebel that exploits her body, right, may or may not be sexual in, in nature, but the freak is totally about um, wild sexual expression without any type of emotional uh, closeness, intimacy, or commitment. So then when we look at post-traumatic slave syndrome, according to Vegan, uh, it's the travel of African people to America was an extremely uh, tumultuous one. Um, in my graduate class uh, on YouTube, there is a video that it is extremely um, disturbing and graphic, but I always, I always kind of give my 
um, graduate students a trigger warning, but it's something that I think everyone must see. Because it really, it's one thing to say it was difficult for the slaves and, for, and to say that they were chained together. And right, it kind of makes it seem like it was kind of like a cruise in which they were kind of chained together. But this video clip really brings it, I mean, shows the reality. So for example, um, if, you're, if you were chained to the person next to you, you oftentimes urinated, you defecated on one another. You had children chained to the person next to you. Oftentimes, many of these children did not survive. So this was a lot, there was clearly a lot of disease within this context. So this is actually why many of them died as well. So, uh, and then the second, despite being freed from enslavement in 1865, in terms of the peculiar institution, which is oftentimes in the literature refers to as slavery, they still linger, impact the mental well-being of, of African Americans, and generally have not been adequately understood by mainstream therapists. And the reason why is because post-traumatic slave syndrome is not in the DSM. It just isn't. It is not in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, which is the Bible of psychiatrists and psychologists. So if a person is exemplifying certain symptoms, um, you, based on how, oftentimes how post-traumatic slave syndrome works, you can't diagnose it. But just because you cannot diagnose it does not mean that a person is not suffering from it to some degree. We're going to actually in a, in a minute look at the various degrees by which individuals can, can uh, suffer from it. So this, this second bullet in particular addresses the, one, of, one of the key points of what I'm discussing today, that even though we are no longer enslaved, right, the effects of post-traumatic slave syndrome are still alive. They're still here, right? Even though, you know, this is, this is, this is not something that um, the federal government will put monies into and into getting treatment for individuals for, um, it is still an issue today. Well, labor and mental trauma has contributed to a condition known as post-traumatic slave syndrome. So, as we mentioned before, the tumultuous uh, conditions in which African Americans, uh, and Africans rather, came to America was one that was very difficult on them physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, in every way they were in some way affected. So in terms of the, the discussion, um, it, the success of this show is, one thing I will, I do, I will say that I like about it is the ability for Shonda Rhimes to actually kind of just be this powerhouse uh, in terms of producing uh, noteworthy, why oftentimes highly recognized um, areas of, of of television um, uh, uh, in the form of um, Grey's Anatomy, Scandal, and How to Get Away with Murder. So both of these women have actually worked together uh, due to Shonda Rhimes' um, direction, due to Kerry Washington's uh, high level as an actress, and create a strong loyal following for Scandal. I think the second thing is so important because Scandal would not have the high ratings that it has if only African Americans were watching. It just wouldn't. It just it would not, right? And the fact that it's on one of the major networks, ABC, right, says a lot that you know blacks are watching it, but so are whites, so are Latinos. So are Asians. In fact, uh, during the National Association of African American Studies Conference, I actually had an Asian gentleman come to me afterwards and say, this is just so interesting because I'm Asian and, you know, my girlfriend is white. And, you know, she makes me watch the show with her, is how, is how he put it. So perfect example, right, that, you know, uh, an anecdotal uh, verification there, right, that it's not just uh, blacks that are watching the show. Um, um, and so I, the third bullet, while black men and women are instrumental in scandal success, we believe that the social historical position between black men and white, uh, white men, um, uh, black women rather, and white men make our appeal 
that uh, black women recognize the broader implications of a show, especially between the, especially like in terms of the position of the Fitz and the Pope character. So this is the, uh, in terms of post-traumatic slave syndrome, I've already uh, focused a lot on, on what this involves, right? So this is a lot of the residual realities that uh, the descendants of slaves have had to deal with be, uh, 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 because of uh, being enslaved. Um, the second issue is cultural misorientation. And we're gonna look at this and then the conceptual framework on which we, on which is built. And cultural misorientation, these are according to moderate uh, and severe. So we'll look at this in a moment. So here we are here. This is a wonderful kind of segue. As you can see, white supremacy operates everything. It, it really controls everything. Does. So that's why it's at the top. The media is one of the most um, potent forms in which, remember, white supremacy is the values, attitudes, and beliefs are elevated, and every and the attitudes, beliefs, and, and, and behaviors of every other group is minimized. So when we look at the, the media's influence and scandal definitely will fit into that, it actually results in post-traumatic slave syndrome, uh, according to Geary and Leary. In the fact that the majority of television shows that are on TV do not represent blacks, right? So the fact that scandal is successful makes it in many ways a kind of societal outlier in that respect, right? So this is actually why it's actually coming from the media. Olivia Pope is actually in the middle and I actually have her representing the matriarch, the Jezebel, and the lady characters. Remember, the matriarch is the person who is essentially a mother, right? She is the one that holds everything together. So when her children's lives are falling apart, she's the one that gives them advice. She tells them what to do. She tells them when to do it. She tells them how quickly things should be done. So in that way, I don't, I'm not sure if anyone has not seen the show, but I definitely see the matriarch character with her. And what's interesting is that she's clearly not old enough to be the mother of the people that work with her, but it's interesting when you look at the dynamic between her and the individuals that work in Olivia Pope and Associates. She's always dragging them out of various messes, right? Mm -hmm. Telling them what to do, directing their lives as a matriarch, or as a mother would do. The second uh, clearly is the Jezebel character. We see that uh, Fitz's character with Olivia is highly sexualized. It's a highly sexualized relationship, as was shown in the clips that I mentioned to you. Um, several of these sexual encounters occurring in the White House as well. So essentially showing the, the Jezebel character there. and. Um, even though some individuals try to, you know, try to paint the Fitzgerald Pope relationship as a very romantic one, um, she is his mistress. She is. <laughs> she is already married to Millie, right? Um, so she would clearly represent the Jezebel trope there. But then she's also, according to Collins, 